Hello, everyone. I'm Ian McAllister. I'm Jamie Adams. And I'm Oliver Kinner. And this is Brainwaves episode 144, bringing the best in tabletop gaming news. These are the headlines for the week of the 10th of June 2024. Steamforged press on. UK Games Expo expands. Diana Jones announces finalists. All this and more on this episode of Brainwaves. As you'll come to see over the course of this episode, it's a bit of a merger palooza at the moment. The biggest one this week is the acquisition of the Iron Kingdoms universe from Privateer Press by Steamforged Games. Privateer Press are the makers of the War Machine and Hordes miniature games and the Iron Kingdoms RPG. Steamforged are known mostly for making computer game property board games like Dark Souls and Horizon Zero Dawn. From the press release. For the past 20 years, the Iron Kingdoms and War Machine have enchanted players and hobbyists around the world with rich lore and immersive gameplay. War Machine's growth has been electric since the launch of Mark IV, with new and returning players around the world getting into the game. Now, as we step into this new chapter, Steam Forged and Privateer Press are teaming up to make sure your experience with these games is better than ever. There's never been a better time to start playing. Going forward, we'll work together on design and development of the lines. We at Steam Forge will be bringing our proven 10-year track record of creating, developing and delivering large-scale games to thousands of players and retailers around the world to turn that growth from electric into explosive. That was from the press release from Steam Forge Games and now from the Privateer Press press release. It is with great excitement that we are announcing that Steam Forge Games has acquired the Iron Kingdom's War Machine library of properties, including Warcaster, Neo Mechanica, Riot Quest, Bodgers, and all associated board game, card game, and fiction titles, as well as the Formula P3 hobby products line. Going forward, Privateer will continue to partner with Steam Forged Games to develop War Machine, the Iron Kingdom's RPG, and future products based on the vast intellectual property library that has sprung from the Iron Kingdoms. Privateer will also continue to manufacture War Machine models while working with Steam Forge Games to expand the materials the products are offered in, as well as increasing availability in markets where War Machine is not widely accessible. Chief Commercial Officer of Steam Forge Games, Matt Hart, said, There's a real wealth of creative talent and, as you might expect, genuine passion for tabletop gaming in our team. In particular, we all share a special kind of love for War Machine and the Iron Kingdoms. That, along with our expertise in creating games loved by many, makes us ideally placed to collaborate with Privateer Press in shaping the future of a hugely important franchise. There's a profound sense of duty to nurture its growth and potential, and we take that responsibility seriously. We cannot wait for what's to come for the players in this wonderful world. Chief Commercial Officer of Privateer Press, Matt Wilson, responded... We couldn't have asked for better custodians than Steamforged. Their track record, history with the games, and genuine excitement about the future make them the perfect fit to shepherd War Machine and the Iron Kingdoms into the future, opening up new opportunities and growth channels for all Iron Kingdom titles. We look forward to working with Steamforged in the years to come. Now, there was an update to this acquisition just yesterday, Thursday the 6th of June. In that update, Steamforged give a better idea of what they're going to be doing with the properties they've acquired. In a post entitled Part 1, Vision and Mission, War Machine and Hordes Manifesto, Matt Hart of Steamforge says, So, in short, our first mission is to preserve what's already excellent and focus on improving areas that need it. Right now, we have two key priorities. Strengthening the supply chain, ensuring models and everything else are always available without interruption. This means not only a bunch of back-end work on production facilities, inventory control and logistics, but also collaborating with our distribution and retail partners worldwide to get War Machine into your local gaming stores or FLGSs. Expanding the game's reach. We want to share this game with as many people as possible. That means implementing a solid marketing strategy to help more gamers discover or rediscover the Iron Kingdoms. Engaging with the community is crucial as is building support through organised play, cool events and narratives for gamers to enjoy. We want to make sure we're present at key shows, running demos for everyone and anyone. Beyond this, we're integrating the Steamforge Games and Privateer Press teams to synergise on great art, engaging story and exciting design and development. More details on this will follow, but suffice to say, things are moving in a very positive direction. Now we'll bring you more on this as we get it. Obviously, there's going to be more updates from Steam Forge Games by the sounds of it. Thanks very much to Corey from our Discord for posting about this there. That really helped us out. Now, 
I've played War Machine quite a bit. I don't know about if you guys have any experience with Primitive no. Press and their games. Never played it, I'm afraid. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a decent game. It's a, it's a fairly sort of dynamic um, skirmish miniatures game. It did have some fairly sort of uh, repugnant advertising in its early days where it encouraged you to play like you had a pair. I kid you not. Uh, yeah. I mean, you say, you, say, you say I kid you not. That doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Yeah, I mean, it was a good few years ago, but yeah, still awful. Now, I'm a little unclear as to what Steamforge are getting out of this. Steamforge did start their days off as basically making accessories for Privateer Press's games, War Machine and Hordes. So it's kind of full circle. And uh, the game has, uh, like, War Machine has kind of floundered a lot in the last few years, as I understand. I haven't played it for a very long time. But from my reading around and my understanding of it is there's been quite a lot of updates recently that have angered quite a lot of the player base because it's made older models redundant. And it means, obviously, that retailers have stock on their shelves that they can't sell because players don't want to buy it. Uh, and there's been lots of supply chain issues and that kind of thing, which obviously is alluded to in that first update from Matt there. Uh, I mean, maybe they're getting the ability to make their own miniatures. It sounds like Privateer Press are still going to be making miniatures for the game because all the miniatures that Steamforge make, they make in China, basically, because they're miniatures in, in their board games and their Guild Bowl like miniatures game. That's all. That's all like manufactured in China. So maybe there's a um, getting a manufacturing base in the US kind of vibe to this, maybe getting a bit of it into the US market a bit more. Uh, it doesn't sound like there's anything really left at Privateer. They're basically becoming a de facto arm of Steamforge, best I can tell. Yeah, it sounds like if they've, if, if they've bought everything out, it's just a brand now, basically. And, and maybe they, if they're keeping the team, they're just keeping the skills, they're keeping, as you said, sort of the facilities and... Yeah, and all that stuff, but everything else, yeah, it's just a name that then, yeah, weird. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I say the names become kind of tainted, so I think it's mainly mainly just the properties, and obviously there's maybe some other things they're getting in this deal that we don't know about. From checking out Privateer's site, the only other property they still had sort of listed on their games bit was Monster Apocalypse, and that went to Mythic Games. And obviously, if you've been listening to the cast for the last few weeks, months, and years, you'll know how that's gone really, really poorly. But the yes. Monster Apocalypse Kickstarter has still not delivered despite funding in like 2019, if I, my wow. memory serves correctly. Um, and given the current state of Mythic's Kickstarter projects, you're never seeing that game. Um, sorry, folks. That's just the truth. Um, so yeah, I don't know what's left at Privateer. Obviously, there's some talent there um, that maybe Steamforge won. Maybe it's purely a nostalgia purchase because that's where they started out. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, they're not... Like Steamforge, much as like I may not have totally jived with their games I've, I've reviewed horizon zero dawn folks and you can go and read that on the site like they're a successful company they keep yeah. having six stars relatively on time they've had some they've had, had a couple of muck-ups with like the dark souls board game and the rpg that they released was a bit of a muck-up like it, it was incomplete in a lot you of ways on that, finished, I believe. we did report on that I'll, I'll put a link to that in the show notes but in general, as a big sort of miniatures Kickstarter company, they're relatively well regarded and they deliver mostly on time. I may not like their games, but, you know, as a company, they seem to be doing okay. So let's hope that, yeah, it's all good looked after under the new brand. But Oliver, you and I were at Games Expo recently. We were, and what a big event it was. Indeed. So it's over for another year and just after the doors closed on sunday they released their attendance numbers so the total attendance uh, over the three days was 65,281 and the unique attendance figures uh, or figure is 39,306 and i believe the unique one is literally if you go three days you count as one so that's that's the difference so if you go three so the total attendance is basically, yes, yeah, spread over three days. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Biggest, it's the biggest ever UK attendance with a 31% increase on last year. And Board Game Wire got the scoop on some changes that are happening next year. You may have heard rumors. Apparently, the show will not be using Hall 1 anymore, but instead move into Hall 4. So Hall 1 has been booked out by an undisclosed third party for the next two years. But Hall 4 has been uh, become available instead. So it'll be Halls 2, 3, and 4. That means the convention is aiming to have 20% more space next year. Hall 1 was only, in quotes, only 14,000 square meters, and Hall 4 is 16,700 square meters. 
So the show is still planning an expansion into the event space using shows like Gen Con as a template where there are thousands of events on offer. And obviously with this growth, we'll see. Just to just, just to give some very quick uh, mental images for people who either haven't gone or don't know the NEC in Birmingham. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Ian and Oliver, uh, Hall 1 and Hall 2 are pretty much connected yeah, so like, so it, you go. To, so the NEC is like a huge convention venue and yes, like has yes. five halls in total, if I remember correctly. So hall one is like to your left as you go into the center, and it's like one of the big ones. And then you can go from hall one up to hall two. So they may or may not be connected, depending on the convention you go to. They can shut these things off and make little. Bit, they can do all sorts of stuff to change the the shape of the space. But yeah, they are connected. Yeah, and yeah. two and um, three are connected as well. Hole two and three, sorry, did you say? Oh, no, sorry, no, they're not. No, no. that's wrong. Yeah, well, that's wrong. I don't know whether you might be able to connect them up, but I think hole four is sort of separate, so you will end up going along the corridors, which isn't a problem. There's, they are right next to each other, so they are in reach, so that feels still like one career and event. Cool. Um, yeah, it'll still be the same amount of walking, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess the focus will be hole four. The only thing yeah. is, I think, when when you attend the event previously, you would come in probably that main entrance straight, well, not straight into Hall 1, but it would be straight in front of you, and that would be the focal point. Now with Hall 4 being more further back from that side, maybe the focus would be more on Hall 2 for visitors, unless you come by train and you're coming in the other way, and you're sort of seeing Hall yeah. 3 to start with, and then Hall 2 is on one side and Hall 4 would be on the other. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're going to threat people a bit more, for sure. I don't yeah. know about you listeners, but my brain is hurting. <laughs> but basically, I think I've, I've spoken to a few people and some exhibitors who've been uh, in Hall 1 for a number of years, and especially I'm talking about smaller exhibitors, indie publishers and, and smaller creators and stuff like that. They are now wondering what the focus is. So obviously, I've been moving into another hall. Probably Hall 4, I would gather. But they're yeah. now wondering, well, if we're moving, is it better to actually move into Hall 3 because it's more central? How do I get people to the new stand. So again, you know, people will know where the stand is and find them. And if yeah. you're someone, a big brand, you'll probably have a big logo on the floor plan and people will find you wherever you are, but the smaller ones find it harder. So probably lots of discussions going on. I think there was a meeting during the show with exhibitors as well to discuss that, uh, which was also interesting. It was during the exhibition time. So again, speaking to exhibitors, someone was saying, well, I'm exhibiting. I can't go to this uh, event where we're discussing the new hall. So I don't know. I'm sure there would be more communication coming up anyway. That is weird. That does exclude some of the smaller stands I saw. Like I spoke to a couple of... So I, I, I found the whole thing kind of overwhelming, to be honest, initially, because I haven't been back for five years to UK Games Expo, and it was still big then, but it was you know much smaller. Like a 31% increase on last year alone is mm. quite... Wow, that's, that's a lot. It feels like people have like sort of slowly sort of come out of like the COVID like the strict lockdown COVID times. And like this year is like when people have gone like, oh, it's mostly okay to go back and do these things to people. And it's just gone, boom. Mm. And like suddenly you've got all these people. But yeah, I, I spoke to, I, I tended to focus on indie RPGs and the RPG scene because I didn't feel like a lot of press were covering that. So I could sort of carve a little niche there and there'll be a cast coming out next week with all my interviews with those folk. And I spoke to a couple of people who are basically independents running their own stalls. So those people cannot go to an exhibitor meeting yeah, like they can barely go to lunch, you know. <laughs> yeah, it sounds absolutely exclusive, exclusive because it's it, the ones who are able to visit that are the ones who a have a big enough stall, be able to hire enough people, and that means there's people able yeah. to cover people, which basically means you're talking about your large groups, your large companies, your people who have that yeah. money to throw around. Yeah. The interesting thing this year, I think, was there's quite a few US companies over. So Cephalofair were there, Thunderwork Games were there, Band mm. Rider Games were there. Wow, later games. It, Interestingly, really? right at the back of one of the halls was Darrington Press, who, if you don't know who Darrington Press are, they are the publishing arm of a little-known Twitch streamer called Critical Role. Never heard uh, of them. Never heard of them, yeah. So I think I, I, have a, I have a strong suspicion they were testing the waters of UK Games Expo for a bigger release next year when mm. their big RPG, their D&D sort of rival Daggerheart is coming out. Ooh. So I, I'd imagine you might see Darrington Press back in a bigger way. Uh, I got a review copy of Candle Looks Your from their uh, marketing person, Katie. That oh, really? Lovely. Very nice, her. Yeah. Like, nice looking book. Uh, I'll be doing a first read of that at some point and I'll get it to the table and then do a play, play focused review as well. Looks pretty cool. Yeah. So it's interesting to see what happens. I'm sure there'll be more communication. And what is also interesting if you are going next year, if Hall 
one is booked around the same time, does that mean there'll be more people trying to get to the NEC at around the same days? I don't know when they actually shut and close the event. So for a couple of years, there was like a sci-fi sort of like... Electromania. Electromania, yeah. That was, that was in Hall 5 for the one, a couple of years. The one on the, one on on the, the other right side. Coming, yeah. Yes. That, yeah, because the last time I went was also 2019. Yeah. So that was when Collect Mania was still on. So yeah, that was in the hall directly from the other side. And just to clarify, NEC is much bigger. I, I had to walk to the one of the hotels further apart and you walk like through hell, up to Hall 12. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, there's, it's a huge area. I don't know how much of that is used yeah. regularly and stuff. And obviously for UKG attendance, you're focusing on those sort of halls one to four. But yeah, this? Yeah, it's a huge place. I had a query, again, it's been like five years since I've been there as well. Was there any use of the Hilton? Yes. Yeah, there was, some, there was, yeah, there was some open gaming space in there, but not near, nearly as much as they've had in the past. Cool. I was, I was just wondering. Yeah, it's yeah. the usual sort of RPG sessions. I think the Starship Simulator and all that stuff is in there. Cool. Yeah. Anyway, it's been a while, Jamie, but you got to put on your awards, Homburg, once more. Yes, been waiting for this for a while. Now, we're talking about UK Games Expo. There's another expo coming very soon, and that is Gen Con. And what does Gen Con mean? That's right, the Diana Jones Award, the coveted Diana Jones Award, has announced its finalists for this year's competition. The five finalists are Adepticon, the largest wargaming convention in the world, and the new home of Golden Demon, Games Workshop's premier painting contest. Amy Bio, owner of Pink Tiger Games, and designer of Flatter Me, You Think You Know Me, and Cloud9. The awards say of Amy, She has been on a mission to share compassion and empathy through tabletop games. There's also Fastival, a Danish board game and RPG event, known for design innovation and the birth of Danish freeform, a genre of single scenario RPGs. TTRPGs for trans rights in Florida, a bundle of role-playing games organised by Rue Dickey, over on itch.io, which raised over $280,000 for their partner organizations and LGBTQ plus groups in the state of Florida. And United Paizo Workers, the first workers union in the tabletop gaming industry, which was voluntarily recognized in 2023 from Paizo Inc. Management. Now the winner will be announced on the 31st of July at the unofficial kickoff of Gen Con, which is taking place in Indianapolis, Indiana. Now, the new trophy is a Perspex blue and white light up uh, square based pyramid. Sadly, the old trophy, a Perspex pyramid with a remaining fragment of the infamous TSR Indiana Jones RPG, which was famously burned. Rubbish. And yeah, awful. Uh, unfortunately, that got lost in the post a long time, well, a couple of years ago. Now, in the parallel realm, is missing post. I don't know about you. Very interesting selection of nominees. Yep. Very diverse yeah. selection of nominees this very year. Like, so right. sometimes they tend towards a certain trend and theme or something like that. But this year it's very, very open, very wide. Right. Very, mm-hmm. And it gives a lot of um, exposures, like a dirty word sometimes, but it does give some exposure to those organizations, which is really good. And yeah, and I'm sure that it, it, any one of those would be a worthy winner. I'm yeah. sure. And again, the Diana Jones Award it is kind of unique almost in regard that it doesn't just go for games or people as you can see from the nominees it can be a whole selection of things it can be people it can be events it can be organizations it It can be games it has been games games itself yeah 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 but yeah it's really interesting award best of luck to the nominees and congratulations for getting nominated and we'll report on the winner when that comes to be oh absolutely congratulations yeah now on to some updates Just under a year ago, Elizabeth Hargrave, designer of cultural juggernaut Wingspan, amongst other games, posted a thread on Twitter pointing out the lack of female nominees for the Spiel des Jahres that year, and criticising the pipeline for game production in general that resisted women designers. Ryan Dancy, CEO of Aldrich Entertainment Group, replied to this Twitter thread, speculating that the reason he doesn't get many women designers pitching to him is that they are socialised to avoid harsh criticism. That reply, and you can check out the full version of that reply in our show notes, got Ryan a lot of justified backlash. He went on Twitter the following day, apologising and making pledges to help. Those pledges were... We are going to actively connect with designers from underrepresented demographic groups, especially women, and offer mentorship and development support of their projects, even if AEG is not publishing games of that kind. 
Some people have suggested various organizations that could benefit from our support. We will proactively reach out to the groups that we have been made aware of and aggressively look at pitches from members of these groups. Our goal has been to publish the very best games. We are going to expand that goal to help and provide more support to the people who we want to be in business with, get to a place where they are being seen and published. He asked folk to hold him accountable, so we did. We aren't going to read out the whole thing as it's pretty long, but he does. Um, he has eventually replied to this uh, and actually given a sort of update as to what AEG are doing. In it, he gives a breakdown of the company, saying that five of the employees are women. He also notes that the new product pipeline has been closed over the last year or so. About halfway through his uh, update, he says this. At our leadership summit at the end of January this year, our team recommitted ourselves to the goal of widening our reach when prospecting for new game pitches. When we are ready to reopen our pitch pipeline, we plan to be more actively visible in the spaces where we believe we can find and connect with an even more diverse de designer community. Coincidentally and beneficially, it appears the industry is self-generating many new venues where these connections may occur, and we're going to seek to take advantage of those opportunities. Another part of that is finding ways to support people at the beginning of their design careers when they are making their first forays into the business of game design. We continue to research and evaluate opportunities AG may be able to assist with in this area, but progress so far has been slow other than relationship building with individuals. Ryan rounds off his reply by saying, Diversity is both an objective and a set of values. I'm proud to work for a company that has embraced the challenge of being a part of the change that the industry needs and is experiencing, and I'm happy that we are on a path of continuous improvement in this area that is generating results. Except, Ryan, that you are not on that path in any way or form. Your three pledges from last year, you've done literally nothing towards. You're just saying, I, I've read this reply in Phil, folks, and I do encourage you to go and read it. It's a bit, it's a bit long for us to like read out on the cast, but it's not actually a long read. It's, it's, they've just done nothing, basically. Like they, it doesn't matter if their production pipeline was closed. What they pledged to do was reach out and help designers like basically get some feedback and that kind of thing. They could have done that. I'd have loved them to have done that. That would have been brilliant. That would have been fantastic. <laughs> there are lots yeah. of organizations out there. He names he names drops a couple of organizations in the piece, like uh, the Rose Gauntlet Association and a couple of others that we've reported on before. But just name drops them. Doesn't actually say like, and we've done with this with them or anything like that. It just like plops them in there. As they're like, Basically. look, we know they exist. Isn't that great? Aren't we wonderful? So the summary of what his reply basically is, we have done nothing, but we want to be yeah. seen to be doing something. So we'll definitely do something now. So yeah. I think we set ourselves a reminder yeah. for another year to check whether actually anything has happened. Yeah. I was going to say, I've, I've just set a reminder on my phone uh, for yeah. the, this, and you can uh, be test testament to this, listeners. I've set an alarm and I'm showing it to Ian and Oliver right now that says yeah. on the 6th of June, 2025, is Ryan Dancy still accountable a year on? Now I have a feeling, well, actually, I'm not going to say anything. That's fine. All I'll say is... Predictions, it's, please it's, send them to us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's one of the first times I've really regretted that we run a clean cast, to be honest. Yes. Uh, it, yeah. Because I really it's, want to say more. It's, polit it's political. It's great political talking, which is talking a lot, but saying Nothing. not very much at all. I do... I, do nothing and it'd be so easy to do something that's where my anger comes from it'd be so easy for them to have done something anything but they haven't the whole th the whole thing smacks of oops somebody paid attention and actually yeah. asked us to, to what we've done that that's but what it's industry has remembered things well that's strange people are asking me something i said a year ago and this this <laughs> is why we need good journalism in the and good yeah. like criticism and good journalism in the tabletop industry and in any creative endeavor folks that is why you need this stuff i just signed up to rascal recently which is the new rpg review site from lynn cadega chase carter and sorry their compatriot whose name temporarily escapes my mind but they're doing some great work over there i've just signed up to that it is paywalled a lot of this stuff like you can do like a monthly subscription kind of thing work is fantastic there's a lot of like i of like there's I'm sure some of our listeners are aware that Dicebreaker haven't posted stuff in a long time because they got bought over by IGN recently. And there's a lot of rumors going around there. We're not going to report or confirm anything there because we don't know, but it doesn't look great. Dicebreaker might come out on the other side, but it's probably going to be a very different site. And they were doing some decent criticism as well. We, we need this kind of thing to hold people accountable or 
Yeah. This this is like this is horrible, like what Ryan said and the reply and that he hasn't done anything. But in the scale of what could be happening in this case, kind of minor. But it lets yeah. bad actors start to get away with stuff, and that can you know snowball out the way a bit. Could, could, no, no, none no, of this, a lot of the time. Yeah, yes, yeah, none of this should be happening. To quote Malcolm no. Tucker, and actually one of the few things I think I can quote Malcolm Tucker that is suitable for um, all audiences. Suitable for all Yeah. But uh, and up, now our next update is from way back in October last year, I think, if I remember rightly. It is, and. Um... Yet we haven't forgotten about this. Uh, so last year in October, in episode 131, we reported that the Essen Spiel Games Fair, the largest tabletop convention in the world, was using, guess what, AI art across the estate to promote the fair. The images were creepy, and the organization weathered a storm of very justified internet anger. Mouthfalark, the company that runs the show, said to Board Game Wire, The online discussion was big, or semi-big. We got feedback via mail, especially from artists exhibiting at Essen, saying, hey, we don't like that. Some American exhibitors also said, not the best choice, maybe. So we realised there was a discussion going on about two weeks after putting the pictures online. The same representative said, We have to keep in mind that there are ongoing uncertainties regarding laws and all that, things that we were not aware of in the beginning. The development of the new technology is discussed in law and society at the moment. So before that is finalised and there is a consensus found for remuneration, for acceptance and all that, we want to focus on the positive things and not create a new discussion. And then our agency had a great idea to still convey these emotions without AI art. In a positive piece about AI-related news, artist Joan Gaudier, the illustrator behind the White Castle game, is working on a manifesto challenging the use of generative AI within the industry. He told Board Game Wire, The fact that Essenspiel is willing to drastically change their approach to generative AI is really positive for the board game community. For a start, it shows that voicing our opinions, both as artists and consumers, can make a big difference. It also casts doubt on this idea of the inevitability of AI. There are still important choices to be made. This is a good development, and we can only hope that other board game companies and events see this as an example of how to avoid similar situations. Human-made art is core to the creation of board games. It gives depth and soul to projects, as well as rooting them in ideas or concepts that only exist in the creator's mind beforehand. I also believe that giving away this part of the process to AI is turning our backs on creativity and new ideas. Well said. And also, um, real people don't make draw people with five fingers and creepy looks and, oh God. I'm just yeah. reading... Reading out the statements we, we, from... You do uh, have five fingers, Oliver. Sorry to oh, tell sorry, you. Six fingers. Oh, my God. I see. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've, got, I've got five. <laughs> Maybe I'm AI generated. You know what I mean? It just, it just <laughs> yes, awful. I do. But reading these statements from... That would be a pullback and reveal. Oliver Kinn is actually AI generated. <laughs> You've not seen me. Um, well, I actually have, have now. now. So you have now. I, I haven't. For all I know, it's going to be a long con. <laughs> Could be. It was a very long Kong UK. Anyway, um, <laughs> reading reading these statements from Matt Flug, I do wonder whether they've been written with Chad GPT. Um, sorry, I just had to say that it's is awful. Their statements about oh well, there's still discussion about the legality of this and all that. No, no. At the moment, it's just unethical. You're a big company. You can afford to pay people, and you've paid apparently paid this agency to not pay creative people to make art for you where was that oversight lost and then you watch oh you look at some of the ads that were pulled now what was the dice tower that also look very similar i yeah i just i don't know what to say really it's just disgusting to see big companies using ai art it's not illegal it's only unethical and when have ethics ever stood in the way of making profit well we don't know whether it is illegal or illegal at the moment that's what they're trying to decide in the courts but well, at, it's just at this moment yeah. At this moment, it's yeah. not illegal. I mean, technically, technically correct. There, are, there hasn't been anything struck down in law in most places that I'm aware of in terms of actual like law at the moment. But yeah, it's it's horribly unethical, and yeah, who knows what? And once these AI bots start like aping Disney and things like that, that's going to be a fun, fun, fun thing to watch because it is going to happen. Unless you use the Mickey Mouse that's been released now, that's no longer 
protected. very particular steamboat <laughs> willy <Willie Mickey. laughs> exactly yeah. Yeah. Well, not Mickey Mouse, yeah. <laughs> anyway if you're not sure if you're not sure what's legal or illegal maybe you should join a union Wow. Back in episode 142, we let you know that the Independent Workers Union of Great Britain had started taking on tabletop gaming members. This is part of the Game Workers section of the organisation. We'd reached out for an interview, but hadn't heard anything back. But while Ian was at UK Games Expo, he was tapped on the shoulder by Eric, an organiser of the Games Workers part of the union. And Ian had a chance to chat with him. What you're about to hear is live from the show floor at UK Games Expo 2024. So the sound quality will be a little different to the rest of the show. Uh, so I've just grabbed another interview at the Soul of It stand. I'm here with Eric, who is behind the sort of like uh, union that's just sprung up for tabletop game folk across the UK. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how that's come about and like uh, how people can get involved? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, as you said, I work part time at, at some of it as operations manager, uh, and I recently started a role at the IWGB as organizer at the video games um, workers union. So, uh, who, who are the IWGB? The IWGB are a trade union yep. in the UK, um, and they have various branches for different industries. Right. Cool. And so I started working there as uh, at the game workers branch. Fantastic. Um, so the Game Workers branch started a few years ago, uh, primarily focused on helping the video game industry. Right. Um, and our members recently tabled a motion to expand the constitution and invite on board um, tabletop game workers and yep. board game workers at large. Cool. Um, and yeah, so the IWGB is entirely member-led. Right. Um, so the actions that we take are uh, pushed on by our members. Um, you know, as an organizer, as a member of staff, I, I don't get a vote on yeah. these things. And so all of these things happen yeah, thanks to our members. Great. So uh, why has why that come about now? Like why, why have the members taken that decision now to sort of accept tabletop game workers? Um, I think, to be, honest, to be perfectly honest, I think it was just a case of somebody asking like, oh, why don't we, why why don't we do that? Why yeah. don't we do that? Yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> uh, the games industry has a lot of freelancers working in it, yeah, which is obviously overlaps quite, uh, quite well with... Mm -hmm. Uh, tabletop workers. Yeah, um, I kind of, you know, as an organizer, and I, I, I've been part of the tabletop scene uh, for a few years now. Yeah. So I'm, you know, decently well connected, and I, uh, and I was, yeah, I supported the move. I thought yeah. this is actually a, you know, a good way to use you know, my yeah. position in the in the industry, both as an organizer and as a tabletop worker. So, what are the benefits for like some freelancers that might be listening to this like, to join the join the union? What do they get yeah. from it? Um, so right now, um, you you can ask for contract reviewed, right? Um, but our members, this only started a few weeks ago, really. Of course, so yeah. we're still trying to grow our membership, um, and then it's a case of whatever our members want to take on, uh, we'll support them in doing that, right? Uh, so from the conversations and the meetings we've had so far, uh, we've spoken about uh, working on a code of conduct, right? For publishers and employers to follow, yeah. Um, setting a kind of baseline rate. Uh, we have a lot of, you know, obviously a lot of our colleagues are based overseas in the U.S. A lot yep. of the companies um, that our freelancers uh, are working with are also based in the U.S. Yeah, okay. So it's about getting in touch with um, U.S. unions and facilitating that kind of conversation. Sure. Uh, making sure that conditions are, you know, beneficial for both U.S. workers and U.K. workers. Cool. Have you, uh, what are the sort of ambitions to grow that in the future to like, to like, to yeah, is it, is it like for all tabletop workers, like role playing games, board games, card games? Doesn't really matter. You're, yes, absolutely. Yeah. In there, yeah, yeah, everyone. If you're in, if you're involved in the making of games, yeah, be they video games, <laughs> or board games, or you know card games, you're absolutely welcome on board. Yeah, I mean, and brainwaves. We have told people multiple times to join a union if you can <laughs> because big companies do not care. See all the massive layoffs recently. Yeah, uh, like yeah, absolutely. Coast and Asmodee and all that. So yeah. yeah, it's definitely worth it. Yeah, and there's there's a lot of. Um, you know, there's, there's unions for fiction writers, fantasy writers, yeah. um, screenwriters, um, but we found that our members don't really get the support that they need through those, not yeah. always. Sure. Uh, so I thought, yeah, it would be great to use all the video game experience. And it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, well, thanks very much, for Yeah, time yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Eric, for uh, tapping in on the shoulder and giving that interview. Lovely to hear. And yeah, it's a specific for freelancers. If you're a freelancer in the tabletop gaming industry and you would like some 
support, some uh, potential legal backing for for disputes and such like, uh, join the IWGB. And now on to the news. Now we told you it was a merger palooza and murder palooza, a, a murder palooza, not a murder palooza. Uh, Roll Twenty, the biggest of the virtual tabletops that allows users to play role-playing games with each other online, has added another quiver to its bow. Back in 2022, Roll Twenty grew by acquiring One Bookshelf, the company that runs Drive Through RPG, the biggest online PDF store for RPGs. Now they have picked up Demiplane. Demiplane is an online character sheet portal for RPGs with an impressive interface and built-in dice rollers. There are not a lot of games represented on Demiplane at the moment, so why would Roll20 want to buy them? Well, one of the games that is represented is the forthcoming Daggerheart from Darrington Press, the publishing arm of Critical Role. Critical Role are an actual play show that has taken the world by storm and show no signs of lighting up with the advent of a new edition of Dungeons & Dragons on the way later this year. From the Roll20 press release... Known for its rapid rise as the D&D Beyond for every other game system, Demiplane offers a gameplay nexus for a rapidly growing list of popular TTRPGs, including Pathfinder 2E, Vampire the Masquerade, and Avatar Legends RPG, and more. Each nexus provides a digital character sheet, character builder, and character management, along with a beautiful digital reading experience that assists players in quickly referencing any part of a game's rule system or content. Now, Demiplane currently has 11 games only on it on the site, including Alien from Free League and the Marvel Multiverse RPG. Thanks again to Corey from our Discord for bringing us this story. Now, I've used Roll20 extensively, and Jamie's done so as well, and I can tell you that it is pretty chunky. It's yep. used, it's it's functional, but it's not great, and some RPGs have got like very good carriage sheets in it, some don't, uh, but the, the sort of base system is not great uh, to build on. Uh, I have used Demiplane to play a Dagger Heart one shot, uh, the sort of like the trailer kind of thing that's out for at the moment, and it is very good. It's it's, very, it's an impressive interface. There's like all the mechanics are built into it. You can easily reference rules and that kind of thing. I do think like saying it's the D and D Beyond for every other game system is over egging it a little bit, since there are literally eleven other ga- eleven yeah. games on that that platform right now. That's it. Uh, from like three or four publishers in total. I know one of them so, is Blades in the Dark. Uh, no, Blades in the Dark is not on there. In Demi Play. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I thought I'm talking about Roll20. My apologies. Oh, no, Roll20. Roll20. Yeah, Roll20 has extensive uh, system coverage, like very, very extensive system coverage. But I can see why they would buy it. Obviously, there's the Direct and Press connection there. Their own interface is not great. So maybe they're looking to like improve that. And like get get some of the demi plane character sheets, and it is it is cool stuff on there. It's really interesting character generation, and D and D Beyond has been a massive factor in the growth of Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition, and is going to be, we reckon, even more so when Sixth Edition or whatever you want to call it comes out. The digital integration is probably going to be a step up again. So, yeah, make, makes sense for uh, Roll Twenty to acquire demi plane, and uh, we'll see how they grow in the future. Speaking of growing and acquisitions, Mantic, the UK publisher of the Kings of War miniatures game, amongst other titles, has acquired the brand and assets of River Horse. River Horse is a UK company probably best known for the Labyrinth and Dark Crystal board games. CEO of River Horse, Alessio Cavatore, has worked with Mantic CEO Ronnie Renton before when they were both at Games Workshop. The first game produced under Mantic will be the fourth anniversary of the Labyrinth board game. Now, you two seem to know more about Mantic and River Horse, so I'll let you have it. Uh, Mantic, I mean, obviously after the IP here, again, it's a, another weird collaboration, well, a weird merger like we had above with Steamforce and Privateer Press, where both companies are going to continue to exist, but Mantic are doing the sort of heavy lifting of distribution and development right. of games and that kind of thing. So it sounds like they're after the IPs mostly. Um, what that'll mean for the future of River Horse, uh, I don't know. But yeah, I, I could I could see, for instance, like a Dark Crystal Miniatures game. And if you don't think that would work, please check out Moonstone from Goblin King Games, which has that kind of vibe to it, for sure. I'd also, I'd also like to point out the River Horse, as well as doing 
games like that. They also have done the My Little Pony Tales, uh, Tales of Equestria role-playing game, which apparently was very good. I have no experience with My Little Pony or the role play, that role-playing game, so I will not comment on that. However, I will comment on the Labyrinth board game. Go on. It was a thing. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was notoriously not very good. Right. No. But moving on swiftly. GameFound, the tabletop-focused crowdfunding platform that has risen to prominence over the last couple of years, has announced a change to the way it operates. Entitled Creator Stores, this feature will allow folk to use GameFound to make storefronts to sell their goods. From the update... With the most recent platform update, creators can start new projects under the store category. You can create one store to sell items you have in your inventory that are ready for shipping. Of course, crowdfunding and other options will remain available at all times. We're ensuring that in-store projects and transactions is as simple as possible. We'll put links to the page where you can find out all about this in our show notes. And once again, thank you so much to Corey in our Discord for bringing this to our attention. Uh, now, we have said many times on many crowdfunding things, especially about Kickstarter, uh, because Kickstarter have said, Kickstarter is not a store. But now GameFound is, sort of. Uh, they are, uh, yeah. I think they're going to be pretty careful here. Cause, yeah, I think so. Like, if they if they dilute what they're offering, do they risk like alienating creator? Yeah, alienating people and alienating creators. They're going to bring money to their platform, and also, do they risk potentially confusing consumers as to what's crowdfunding and what's uh, something I can buy right now? Uh, I don't know. If they make it clear, maybe it'll be good. I mean, people will be able to do things in one place. Don't know. Yeah, but it's, I think it's going to be confusing to solve but we'll, we'll see what they do with it but ultimately lots of crowdfunding campaigns have like a pledge, pledge manager afterwards and then you can blade pledge so it's almost a store at that point even though the, i know the game hasn't produced by then or yeah. manufactured by then but it sort of feels like it's a natural sort of extension to what game found is doing but yeah they have to be careful how they present this definitely yeah speaking about confusing things we are talking about when is a board game and not a board game well when it's both so, see, it, a board game can be a board game and not a board game at the same time. And the final state is based on whether it has been observed or not yet and how the wave function collapses. Why are we talking about this? <laughs> I'm not really sure. Well, Germany's Federal Ministry of Education and Research has provided €820,000 to a project led by Uwe Rosenberg. The project is developing a game about quantum technologies to help teach about the workings of research laboratories. Laboratories? Yeah, I always never know whether to say laboratories, laboratories, yeah. The project is called Quantista, and the first prototype of the game will be played next year. The publisher, Skelly Games, will produce 3,000 demo copies for game fairs and cafes and make the game part of the catalogue after the project is over in May 2027 except it might not be over, or maybe it is both, depending on whether you're observing it or not. But yeah, no, it's just nice to see more sort of science games that are actually used as a teaching tool rather than, you know, just for entertainment. So yeah, interesting project, especially quantum technology is always interesting. Um, I think edutainment is a, I mean, for years now, for over 30, 40 years, it's been a very difficult uh, line. Worried. Pardon? A bit of a dirty word. I mean, it's a dirty word because it's been a very fine line to tread uh, with video games and and board games uh, and potentially role-playing games. Uh, Like, things that stick in my head, things like Genius Games, who for a long time did science-based board games. I had one called Mm. Cytosis, which was a worker placement game based in a cell. I found that quite interesting, personally. Uh, Not to everyone's taste. But, you know, let's see how this goes. And quantum engineering, I mean quantum technologies that use yeah. quantum mechanics in engineering Qua- i mean quantum computing is the big one right now yeah in, in terms of like getting computers to be faster okay and if you've if the name uwe rosenberg sounds familiar <laughs> some of the biggest worker placement games i mean literally literally the biggest things like oh correct me if i'm wrong on this agricola averna uh i was just going to say whether in the game you have to feed the quantum I don't know. Maybe you do. Because <laughs> it's, it's all those games, obviously, no more. Yet you have to feed your workers. Feed your workers. At some point. Yeah. What's the one that you have, Ian? A feast, a feast for Odin? Feast for Odin. Okay, yes. 
we'll get to play at some point. I, 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 maybe. But no, this does sound interesting, and I hope it walks a good line, and it is not only informative, but also, most importantly, a good game and entertaining. So, yeah. dual yeah. importance, I think. Okay, three importance. A good game, entertaining, and informative. Well, it's quantum, so you can have three, or four, or five, all in one. I, I didn't do physics, it. so I'm going to take I don't remember how many that. types of quarks are. Quite a few. <laughs> uh, there's only, uh, I think you found there's only one quarks on Deep Space Nine, but then he's going to franchise out much later. Anyway, moving on to something less tasteful. Now, crowdfunding is full of strange projects, barely their ideas, and flights of fancy. But sometimes, though, there's just things that look like a scam. If you're into tabletop gaming at all and use social media, it is likely that you will have seen an advert for the first Wonders collectible card game. This is a project that was on Kickstarter, then wasn't, then was again. The reason it was taken down was part of the model involves NFT, non-fungible tokens, something we haven't spoken about on the cast for quite some time. Players could speculate on these, and Kickstarter doesn't allow that kind of thing on their platform. The project is back up, but there have been all sorts of odd signs around it. The game itself promises cards that are never going to be reprinted, and has had accusations of not only the art of the card game being AI generated, but that some of the team members attached to the project may not exist and may just be AI avatars. There's a form of Magic the Gathering designer attached, but with some of the team members it is hard to verify their existence. The pseudo computer generated profile pics don't help either. Just when you thought this couldn't get any worse, it seems that some of the game's fans and its developers think doxing people is okay. Now doxing is the act of tying an online public presence to a private one, or even real life details of that individual. It is an incredibly dangerous thing to do, as you don't know what an individual might do with that information. Jeff French, the CEO of the company, doxed a member of the community in the Kickstarter comments, linking the individual's profile on Kickstarter, and they won they have on Board Game Geek. There are a few folk defending Jeff in the Board Game Geek thread we got this from, which we'll link you to in the show notes, and they are incredibly wrong. The project is going to fund. It's currently just under $1 million, and I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot barge pole. This isn't going to work at all. As, as a game, it might work to make them money, but it is not going to work as a game. If you have a competitive scene for a card game where you literally can't buy the cards anymore, then all you're going to do is push folk into the collector's market, and that's going to make them more money if there's any NFT stuff attached to it, I guess. But if it's just being sold between players and they just own the cards, I don't see how it's going to make the company money. They plan, they plan to launch this in November as well, and they're funding now. All right. That's an incredibly short period of like getting this thing done. I, I can't believe I have to say this in 2024. But if you're someone who is listening and going, yeah, doxing is okay. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. I'm, I'm going to say right now, I'm sorry. I think you need to have a real look at your values. Yeah. Why? why it's not okay. Why, this has been not okay for a long time. Why do we think it's okay? I think it's technically illegal in some places as well. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, do you watch out for this company. They uh, they have been incredibly critical of people who are critical of them, but that's okay. We don't mind. Um, well, yeah, just stay away from this game. There are lots of companies out there. If you want to play a CCG, there are loads of them coming back. Like the that model of game is coming back, and there's quite a yeah. few different ones out there from legitimate companies that you can buy and play to your heart's content. Go do that instead. That's my. Or advice. if you really want to find like collectors and stuff, find some of the old collectible card games that were around in the 90s like the Austin Powers role play uh, sorry not role playing game collectible card game I don't want to think of an Austin Powers role playing game <laughs> I'm pretty sure there was one almost certainly yeah uh, yeah. one of the fun things you can do on eBay is buy yourself a big box of old CCGs for very cheap and play them and yeah. that's fine why not yeah. anyway let's move on to some jobs opportunities and events By the time you're listening to this, it will have ended, but over the weekend of the 8th and 9th of June, a host of board game media personalities are hosting a 12-hour live stream to raise money for the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. The charity provides essential medical supplies, food, water and other necessities to those affected by the current war between the Israeli government and Hamas. They've raised $25 million so far, but ongoing support is vital. Organiser Gillian Ross, the marketing designer at Brotherwise Games, told Board Game Wire. After watching other industries do successful fundraising events for Palestinian charities, I felt like it was a no-brainer to do one in the board game industry. 
Now, publishers like Later Games, publishers of Root and Oath, among others, and Cephal Affair, most famous for Gloomhaven and Frosthaven, are donating games to be auctioned off during the live stream. Now, of course, you won't be able to participate now, but the charity still takes donations directly, if that's something you're interested in. We'll provide links to all of that in the show notes. Such a good cause. So, yeah, have a look at the links and please donate if you can. Now, coming towards the end of the cast, I'd like to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters, Kevin Bertram of Ford Circle Games, and James Naylor of Naylor Games and Sean Newman from the Game A Lot team. You can support us as well, but obviously look at the link for the charity first of all. And then if you still want to have a look at our Patreon, patreon.com slash the giant brain. There's various other ways of supporting us. Go to the website giantbrain.co.uk and find the support us page for lots of information there. For example, fan roll, there's a discount code you can use and many other things. Now, the last thing, Jamie, you've got some liars apparently coming your way. I mean, listen, I, I've been away for a bit, you know, and I, and I couldn't... Uh couldn't do the last record and i was i was away in in shetland uh an Orkney. liar no truth oh truth, okay truth, truth this time anyway oh. anyway four or five years ago hasbro started bringing out variants on their classic monopoly that had something of an ironic twist including the cheaters edition where cheating is encouraged but those caught are shackled to the board with a plastic handcuff now cluedo has finally caught up with Cluedo Liars Edition. There's no plastic handcuffs this time. Alongside the usual classic characters with Dr. Orchid replacing Mrs. White as of newer editions, there are 12 investigation cards with six true and six false. You draw one and read it. Now, if another player thinks you're lying, they can hit the large liar button in the centre of the board. Uh, what that does, not entirely sure, wasn't able to get um, a manual read through. But the game ends as normally, working out who did it, where they did it, and what did they do it with. But for the life of me, I can't find figure out what the new weapons all are. Because I, I saw some box art, and it appeared to be, I'm going to say Swedish maybe? There's a revolver, a dagger, and a lead pipe in a Subway sandwich. I got those. There seems to be a poisoned fizzy drink. Uh, what appears to be a candle with a long kind of thick wick that's either going to be dynamite or rope and a garden gnome of some description so you know interesting unusual weapons sounds slightly knives out inspired could very well be very well be um i haven't seen any of the knives out so i'm now going to go and watch it and assume that death by garden gnome is something that happens. If not, I will be supremely disappointed. I know, sorry. Um, you will be supremely disappointed, I'm afraid. <laughs> but you should watch Nice Out, it's very good. Yeah, apparently. Uh, how do you, you know, again, sure, we don't play a lot of, well, I don't know about you guys, I, I don't really play much Cluedo or, or even Monopoly. Um, no shade on anyone who does, of course. You enjoy it, fantastic. Uh, but it's like just the changing of the formula. We've seen it obviously many over the years now, you know, we've got the, the cheaters edition. We had the longest game of Monopoly ever. We had Monopoly mm. socialism. We had that kind of stuff. Changing up the formula. For Cluedo liars. Yeah, Cluedo, uh, Cluedo yeah. liars. Like, I don't see anything particularly egregious about that. I think that's, you know, it's interesting. It's trying something a little bit different. But then there's also running that risk of the, hey, hey, see what we did there? See what we did there? Is that kind of <laughs> knowing, kind of sideways wink, the tongue so far in the cheek, it's just poking out the cheek. Uh, it's that sort of humor that brings people back to our cast and thank you very much for listening if you like what you listen to then the best way to help us out is to share the podcast <laughs> and drop us a review and rating on itunes you can also follow oliver at his blog that's tabletopgameblog.com we'll have an invite to our discord if you'd like to join us we talk about all the new stuff that we cover on the cast alongside games and all sorts in that uh we're not on twitter anymore we're on blue sky you can follow me at giantbrain.co.uk oliver's on there as well and you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and our website is thegiantbrain.co.uk. And if you'd like to email us about any of the stories we've covered in the cast or anything you'd like us to cover, uh, it's giantbrainuk at gmail.com. And if you'd like to talk to us anonymously, then that will be guaranteed for you. Please do get in touch. Thanks very much. We'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you. Yeah. See you then. Bye. Bye, so. Bye.